Amen. Good morning. <clears throat> My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. Um, how many would you uh, would agree with me in saying that last week, well, actually the last couple weeks, have been some of the most overwhelming for you in your life? Just raise your hand real quick. Um, it has, and, and it continues to be, and I think it's going to continue a little while longer. Um, I ask God, what can I give to myself and to my family and to you that would help you um, cope with that? And this is what came to my mind. <laughs> so she played it for you, not that she needed to because you know it. But the first time I, I, I was hearing this, I just closed my eyes and, and focused on the words. And that's what, I don't want you to close your eyes necessarily, but I want you to focus on the words. Hear the words of this song. My hope is built on nothing less, nothing less than Jesus' blood and his righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly lean on Jesus' name. When darkness seems to hide its face, or hide his face, I rest on his unchanging grace. In every high and stormy gale, my anchor holds within the veil. His oath, his covenant, his blood support me in this whelming flood. When all around me my soul gives way, he then is all my hope and stay. When he shall come with trumpet sound, oh, may I then in him be found, dressed in his righteousness, alone, faultless to stand before the throne. On Christ, the solid rock. I stand. No other ground, all of the ground, is sinking sand. I, I just want us to hold on to those words. Those, those words, and it's not that it's a sacred text or anything, all right? It's based on a sacred text. But it's one of those things that when, when it gets just overwhelming, when darkness hides his face from us, then we trust in him. And pastors, I think, said that in, in, in certain sermons I have heard in the last few weeks. So he's not surprised about what's going on, and, and we should not be either. Today is Sanctity of Life, Human, uh, Human Life Sunday, and um, we're just going to, to remember uh, a few things about uh, the lives that are being taken daily um, with abortion and other things like that. But there's also a lot of other things going on, just not just abortion human trafficking and, and sex trafficking and all those kind of things. Uh, we, we try to ask God today to, to take those things away to um, just, just so that, um, you know, these, these people who get caught up in it, they, they, they do. They just get caught up in it. Sometimes they're like slaves. So let's, let's think about the sanctity of human life and let's pray that God would um, intervene in the lives of these people and in the people who are causing it. Uh, so that, that that will be over very very soon, but God is our our everything. He is our all in all, uh, and we, if we call upon the Lord, He's worthy of our praise, and we're saved from my enemies. Let's stand up and sing. I will call upon the Lord.
Thank you, thank you. You may be seated. It is good to have you here. Uh, it is a little chilly outside for, uh, for Dothan, I think, but uh, um, some of us are enjoying it. Some of us are not enjoying us, but uh, we're glad that you're here. Uh, if you're visiting with us for the first time or first time in a long time, uh, I'd like for you to fill out one of these welcome cards, and we'll try to get some information in your hand about our church. Uh, I want to say one other word about... Um, the Lottie Moon offering. Our goal was $3,500, and as of right now, our standing is $29,012, 29012 So, So we were 2900 2900 2900 Well, thank you. You know, at least now you're correcting me, so that's good. Yes, $2,900, $2,012. $2,012. So we were a little short, but that's okay. You know, God, God, God's going to take care of, of that, and, uh, and we're not going to worry about it at all. All right, a couple of things I, I need to tell you. Uh, on the back of your uh, little worship guide, please get one of these today. Um, on the back of it, it, it tells you that uh, there is a copy of the 2021 budget in the back, and it's only one piece of paper on one side, all right? So that's our budget for this coming year. Uh, we will, you have uh, a couple weeks uh, to look it over and uh, ask questions uh, if you have them. Um, and on Sunday, the 31st of January, Sunday, the 31st of January, uh, we're going to vote on, um, on this budget and uh, get things going that way. All right. Now, let me talk about baby bottle boomerang. Okay, say that for me. <laughs> baby bottle boomerang. All right. Um, this is... Uh, this is the baby bottle that we want you to fill, fill with change or fill with that other stuff. They, they call it ones, fives, tens, you know, that paper type money. We'd like to have some of that in there too. But if you just want to write a check, that's fine because, you know, the weird thing about this baby bottle is the top comes off. <laughs> and so you can put, you can put any, anything in there we want. But you've done this before and, and we appreciate it. But you can pick up your bottle back in the, the vestibule back there on the way out. And then on the... Um, 31st of January, we would like for them all to be back so that we can get them to um, the Wiregrass Hope Group, Wiregrass Hope Group. If you go down uh, 84 down here and take a left at uh, Westgate, uh, they're right there on the left in the couple buildings. And uh, so we're supporting this. It's a local pregnancy center, and they not only share information about pregnancies and things like that, but they also share Jesus with these folks. So Let's, let's, uh, let's take it, and, and you would not believe how much loose chain you got around somewhere. Uh, and so get it all out, put it in the bottle, and bring it in. And uh, we're going to just set them on the table back there as they come in. Okay, so bring them in with you as you come. And uh, let's try to get them in by the 31st of January. All right, I think that's all I was going to say. Scriptures today. Scripture today is Ecclesiastes 1 through 4. Uh, Pastor is going to do part 2. I didn't put part 2 up there. Sorry, Pastor, I didn't, I didn't make it. Uh, but uh, this is part two of the sermon, and, uh, and so uh, just go ahead and turn in your Bibles. In Lamentation, <clears throat> chapter 3, verse 22 and 23, we read, The steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. They are new every morning. Great is your faithfulness. Let's sing together. Great is thy faithfulness.
Let's bow our heads as we think about Sanctity of Human Life Sunday and all the things that are going along on even uh, around Dothan and the surrounding areas. We want to ask God to intervene. So let's pray together. Dear, dear Heavenly Father, you are creator of all and the giver of life. You've created humankind in your image to reflect your glory to the world. And we praise you for the work of your hands and what they have done. On this Sanctity of Life Sunday, we mourn that many of your precious sons and daughters have lost their lives too soon. We grieve their absence today and every day. Lord, we are broken people, and we have all sinned against you in so many ways. And we pray that today would be a day of repentance and forgiveness. We humbly come before you knowing that all of us have fallen short of your glory. And we ask that you would forgive us for our sins through the blood of Jesus Christ. Restore us to right relationships with you. Open our eyes, our hearts, our minds, and our hands as we seek to serve you and glorify you through our love for one another. Transform us into new creations. May we truly be your hands and feet in our world, serving others like Jesus came to serve, loving others like we are to love ourselves. Jesus, you made a way for us where there seemed to be no way. We pray today that you would breathe new life into us. We pray you would increase our empathy, compassion, and love for our neighbors, no matter their age, race, ability, background, or need. We pray that, you, uh, that we would be the people whose hearts echo your own heart for your people. Be our strength, Holy Spirit. Help us in, to be champions of life. Jesus, strengthen us and equip us to do your work in all our com uh, communities, our nation, and our world. May we stand for what you have taught us, and may we give you glory in all that you do. We love you, and we praise you on this day and every day. Lord, we thank you for the gift of life. Help us to protect and preserve in every way we can. May you, your will be done on earth as it ends in heaven. And we ask this in your precious name. Amen. In 1 Corinthians chapter 6, verse 19, starting verse 19, Or do you not know that your body is a, is a temple of the Holy Spirit, the inner temple, actually, where the Spirit dwelt, whom you have from God? You are not your own, for you were bought with a price, so glorify God in your bodies. Lord, prepare us to be sanctuaries. Thank you, Brother Joe. Have your Bibles turned with us to Ecclesiastes 3. That's where we were last week, and that's where we'll begin this morning. We're dealing with the subject of grief. 
And uh, while uh, you are uh, finding the text for today, uh, I want to uh, take and just share with you that today is January the 17th, 2021. On January the 17th of 1971, uh, I was ordained uh, into the ministry. So if I go by that date, I have been in the ministry for 50 years as of today. And uh, as I was sharing with Kathy and with Bob back in the back prior to the service early this morning while they were, I think they were trying to drink coffee and become a little bit more awake, uh, but uh, uh, you're looking at, you know, God still does miracles because you can't calculate a fellow being in the ministry 50 years and only being 39 years of age. Uh, you, that don't calculate. But also, uh, concerning baby bottle boomerang, folks, let me share something with you. You already know this. But let me share something with you. We're in a battle, and the battle is not going to get any better. You know that we've had businesses go down. We've had businesses to close. We've had people who are unemployed due to the pandemic. You know, one, there, there are some other businesses, though, that have been going wide open. You know what one of them is? Abortion. It's abortion. You know what the other one is? Sex trafficking. You haven't heard them. You haven't heard them, you know, have any loss. There hasn't been a downturn in young girls being captivated and made slaves to sex. You haven't heard anything about that. You know why? Because it is still wide open. You and I are in a battle, and you're looking at what we're facing as a nation. It's not going to get easier. Now, if you cannot handle the heat now, if you can't handle the heat now, you're not going to be able to handle it two and three years down the road. You're going to have to make up your mind whom you're going to serve. And you're going to have to make up your mind as to whatever price you're going to pay. Either you're going to be sold out or you're going to give in one or the other. And so that's where we are as a nation. And we are becoming more and more reflective of what's taking place in other, other nations as well. In 1954, Lee Fisher became... Uh, on on the staff of the Billy Graham Evangelistic Association, Lee traveled with with Billy Graham to Europe in order to have a big campaign over there. Some of you probably, if you're willing to admit it, remember when Billy Graham went to to especially to to, to England and had great crusades. Did you know that his son Franklin Graham? was to go to England this past year and that every in every city that he was to go and preach that the mayors told said no you can't come you're not invited and what it is they're afraid of the gospel they're trying to stop and shut down the gospel and so that's where we are and we're going to have to make up our minds either we're going to be uh milk babies or whether or not we're going to be people who are standing on the word and who are going to be uh, willing to partake of the meat and uh, take a stand for the Lord and put on the whole armor of God. And that's where we are. And uh, so you and I, we need to understand that. But look with me in Cle uh, Ecclesiastes chapter 3. In Ecclesiastes chapter 3, this is what it says in verses 1 through 4. To everything there is a season, and 
uh, time to every purpose under heaven or paraphrased on the earth. There's a time to be born and a time to die. A time to plant and a time to pluck up that which is planted. A time to kill and a time to heal. A time to break down and a time to build up. A time to weep and a time to laugh. A time to mourn and a time to dance. The writer of Ecclesiastes, who is Solomon, writes in chapter 1, verse 2, Vanity of vanities, saith the preacher, Vanity of vanities, all is vanity. That is that everything, whenever it comes to the earth, none of it ever, ever lasts. No, where, no matter where you find yourself at in life this morning, I got news for you that it's not going to remain that way. Wherever you are, whatever you have, nothing is going to last. Now, in some ways, that's a good thing. If you're going through trouble and a lot of hardship, things of that nature right now, the good news is, folks, it's not going to last. But at the same time, at the same time, there are other things that are going to take place in your life, things that you consider of value, things that you consider important that are going to leave you or you're going to leave them. Grief, considering grief whenever you define grief and this is how I put it it is mourning over the loss of anything important to you and to your life whatever is important to you it doesn't have to be grief that you experience in relationship to having to deal with a funeral home. It can be there, but yet it can be other things that can bring grief to your life. There's this false concept or ideal among some that says that a person of strong faith is above grieving and it's not a necessity for them. Folks, that is so far-fetched. I don't care who you are. There is going to come something in your life that's going to be explosive. There's something that's going to take place in your life uh, that uh, is, is going to be very, very uh, uh, hurtful to you. It's going to be very painful to you. And, and right now you might think that you're doing well, but there's something coming that you're going to have to deal with like you've never dealt with before. The Bible does, uh, uh, does not say, grieve not. It says, grieve not as others which have no hope. In other words, if a person is without Jesus Christ and that person dies outside of Christ, you're looking at that person dies without hope. And the people who are left behind, they have absolutely no hope as to whether or not they will ever see that person again in eternity. In Ecclesiastes, it says in three in chapter 3 that there is a season and a time for everything. There is a time to be born, and there is a time to die. In verse 4, it says, and a time to weep, and a time to laugh, a time to mourn, and a time to dance. Many, many, many years ago, back in probably the same year, 1971, I had the privilege of going to my first evangelism conference in Jacksonville, Florida. I went with uh, five other men, uh, five other preachers, and you're looking at the last of those five passed away yesterday morning he 
was the last of those men. There is a time to be born, but there's also a time to die. There's a time to mourn, and there's a time to dance. Some grief, or rather I should say, since grief is something that we can't get around, how is it that you and I are to look at it? What is to be our perspective whenever it comes to grief? Well, the first thing that we noticed last week, and, and we, we noted two things, and we'll finish it up this morning. But, but I want you to note here this morning that uh, in relationship to grief, one of the things that you and I have to embrace or come to the place of understanding is uh, in relationship to participants. In other words, all participate. There's no one that's going to be able to, to miss out on grief. I don't care who you are, you're not going to miss out on grief. Grief is interracial. In other words, no matter what color of skin you have, no matter uh, uh, what nation that you live in, you're looking at no matter whether your skin be black, white, red, or yellow, it doesn't matter. You're looking at everyone is going to participate in grief. They're going to have it. It's going to come. There are, there are mothers this morning who are in Africa as well as other uh, areas of the world who are holding their babies and those babies are dying because they don't have enough nourishment in order to live or the water is too dirty and as a result the babies are dying because of the bacteria in the water and they're holding their babies, and the babies don't have long to live. No matter who you are, no matter where you are, you are going to be a participant when it comes to grief. Not only is it interracial, it's international. It is everywhere. No matter what continent you go to, you're going to find and experience grief. Here lately, I've been thinking about moving to Australia. <laughs> I say that jokingly, but seriously, sometimes I, I take it more than a joke with everything that's going on in America. I don't know if I want to live here much longer. Maybe Australia would be a good option. Amen. Uh, but I say that kiddingly, but at the same time, I'm sure I'm not the only one who has thought that. But it's international. No matter where you go, you cannot run away from grief. It's going to catch up with you. You're going to have it. And so there's two kinds of grief that we participate in. One is like grief. There's that grief that comes whenever a child leaves home or maybe the last child leaves home maybe they go off to school maybe they get married whatever the reason you're looking at for some that empty nest really has a profound effect upon them there is grief whenever you have a pet to die i have known of people who've had a pet to die on saturday and they didn't show up to church on sunday because they were wrapped up in the grief of a pet Whenever you have a, an animal that you feel affection toward, it happens. Whenever you move from one, one, one area of the country to another and you have to leave friends behind, there is a grieving process that takes place in relationship to that. But then not only is there light grief, that is considered light grief, there's also what we consider heavy grief. Uh, and heavy grief is whenever you have a loved one to die 
whenever someone passes away, especially if they, it's even more so whenever someone passes away suddenly, unexpectedly. Whenever someone is laying there and they have cancer or some other disease and it is a lingering situation and they are in misery and pain, it seems to be a little bit easier to let them go over a period of time. But whenever it is sudden, unexpectedly, you're looking at it is heavy grief. And so there is the pain that comes. There is emotional pain uh, that comes with it. Whenever there is divorce, separation, whenever there's a wayward child, uh, whenever there's a critical illness, whenever there's a job loss, whenever a home is destroyed, uh, whenever you are living in a nation like we're living in a nation today with what's taking place in America, there's not the first one of us in here, I hope, that's not grieving over what's taking place. There's not the first one of us here who, are, who, are, who is not bothered by what's happening in this country. If you're not bothered, then I don't know. Maybe you're a robot, not human. I don't know. But if you're human, you've got to be somewhat disturbed about it. And so there, there, is, the, there is this perspective of grief that all are participants. You're not going to be able to escape it. The second thing that we noted last week was not only the participants, but the pain. In other words, there's always pain that comes with grief and whenever whenever the pain comes there are a number of, of, of whenever it comes to pain there are a number of things that are involved in the pain number one there is emotional pain if a person dies unexpectedly you look at it there can be shock that takes place and even at the funeral could be that no one is weeping in the family. It's not because it's not because the family is not sad. It's just the fact that they're going through shock. That's what's happening. And so there is emotional pain. Not only is there emotional pain in relationship to it or due to shock, there's also guilt. In other words, why didn't I do more? If I had only had known. How many have said that? But then there's also anger that it's involved. We get mad at the person because how dare they die and leave us like this. Sometimes we get angry at ourselves because we fail to see what was going on. Or, or maybe we feel like that we were inadequate to help the individual or the situation. And then we also become mad at God. God, why did you allow this to happen? Why, God, why? And so we go through shock. We experience guilt. We go through anger. We encounter anger, and we also encounter fear. Because after all, it reminds us that we're going to die as well. I could be next. But there's something here that we did not get into last week due to time that I want to mention this morning, and that is not only the emotional pain, but, but uh, there's also lonely pain. In other words, people don't know what to say at times. So they do nothing. There's not the first person in here who hasn't uh, encountered maybe a, a friend or, or a neighbor or a loved one who has experienced tremendously great grief and, and uh, they, uh, or rather you may have been at the place to where you just did not know what to say. And so because you didn't know what to say, you 
did nothing. Can I tell you that what you say is not near as important as just being there? Because there's nothing that you're going to say that's going to relieve that grief. But what you can do is, and I know today is a little bit different day, but to a large degree, in some shape, form, or fashion, we can be there. We can be there maybe through a car, through a phone call. There's ways that we can be there. Deep grief can be very, very lonely. But then not only is it, not only is it lonely pain, there's also the fact that it's hard working pain. For instance, whenever somebody goes into deep grief or experiences it, according to psychologists, this is what they say. They say that it takes, especially in relationship to death or an event that happens that brings about uh, grief, that it takes six to ten hours of discussing the event or the person over a period of six months before you even begin to heal. The Bible tells us about Job. Job, uh, he lost his wealth, he lost his family, he, he lost his health, and within a short period of time, and Job in chapter 3 said this, Curse, curse the day that I was born. Let the day be perished wherein I was born and the night in which it was said that there is a man child conceived. In other words, Job said in the midst of his grief, he said, listen, I wish I had never, ever been Grief is a very painful thing. But then I want to get to where we need to get to today. Not only is the fact that, there, that each of us are participants, not only is there the fact that grief is very, very painful, but there's also a couple other things. And that is that whenever it comes to grief, whenever it comes to grief, uh, there is a plan. If you're a believer. And I'm speaking on the basis as a believer. If you are a believer, if you have been born again, if you are a child of God, that every, every speck of grief, every bit of it, God wants to use it. You have heard me say time and time again, from this pulpit that there is nothing that takes place in the life of a saint who is surrendered to him that is not filtered through the hands of God the Bible says and and this is a verse that you never quote you, you I, I've learned that you because it's very difficult for a family to to handle it at a at a funeral and that is Romans 8 28 for we know that all things work together for those who love God for those who are called according to his purpose. It's hard for a family in the midst of a funeral to handle that, so I very seldom ever use it. But the truth of the matter is, that's true. Everything works for the good to those who love God, for those who are called according to his purpose. In other words, God wants to use our grief. God has a plan and it and the plan is that that of a person of a of a spiritual impact in other words God wants to use whatever he's allowed to be filtered in and through your life in order that you might be a blessing and of greater benefit to his kingdom There is reality whenever it comes to God's plan. 
there's reality that is involved. In Ecclesiastes chapter 1, verse 2, and I read it a while ago, Vanity of vanity, saith the Lord, or saith the preacher, rather, all is vanity. In other words, it's very, very hard for me to tell young folks how insignificant it is where you live. It's hard for me to tell young folks it doesn't really matter the car or the vehicle you drive. It doesn't really matter. There's other things that are more important than the house you live in. There's something that is more important than the car you drive. It's very, very hard for me to convince them that, that those things are really are of limited value. And so they go out there and they spend $50,000 on a, on a vehicle. They'll take and put $300,000 in a house. And when it comes to the Lord's work, well, they just can't find the money. They've got their, their priorities all messed up. And whenever it comes, whenever it comes to, to grief, and a person begins to encounter grief, one of the things that grief teaches us is that everything here is vanity. Folks, it doesn't make any difference what you have that is earthly. It is of limited value. It's just a matter of time before somebody else lives in that house. And it's just a matter of time before a record comes and picks up that new vehicle for years that has turned old and, and it's a nothing more than a piece of junk. And they're going to take it to a to a junkyard and they're going to crush it and then they're going to take and, and, and take it through the heat process and make new metal out of it then make another car for somebody else to, to buy and spend probably at that time $75,000 on or more. It's just a matter of time before it's going to decay on you. It's not going to last. There's nothing here that lasts. And so you're looking at the purpose that God uses, the plan that God uses for, for grief in our lives is to teach us, to help us to learn that all is vanity. And that we won't be so focused on the here and the now and stuff that has absolutely of no value. I was telling my granddaughter the other day, and she's one of these granddaughters that if I say that I'm gonna get I'm gonna get me something, I'm gonna get me another vehicle or something, you know what she says? I want it when you die. Yeah, you got some too. Granddaddy, I want that whenever you die. I told her I wanted a three quarter ton. I'd like one day to get me a three-quarter ton because I need been pulling a, the tractor and hauling the tractor and things of that nature and hauling cattle and things of that nature. Sometimes you just need a bigger truck. And so she said, Granddaddy, I want that truck. I said, you ain't going to get it. And uh, uh, she said, why, why, I'm, um, why am, am I not going to get it? You're not going to take it with you. I said, lady or girl, I'm going to be buried in it. No sense in me buying a casket, just make the hole a little bit bigger and just put me in the back seat. She didn't think that was a good idea either. She thought that was a waste. But there's a reality. There's also, there's also in relationship to God's plan, not only, is there, not only does it bring us to the reality that everything is vanity, it also... Uh, in that process brings us to the place of relationship and a fellowship with God that we did not have before. You can't live for this world. You cannot live focused upon the here and now and have a right relationship and fellowship with the Lord. You can't do it. 
because you're looking at your worshiping and giving in to a God of this world instead of a Lord God who created this world. You see, grief helps to create a desire for us to be closer to Him. And so there is a plan. But then I, I've got to close this out because I'm running out of time. God does have a plan for your life. He's got a plan for the grief in your life to get your attention, to draw you closer to Him and to bring you to Him in a way that you have never been before and to give you understanding and comprehension that unless you go through the grief, you won't ever understand. You've got to lose a child to understand what it is to lose a child. Amen. You've got to have your house to burn and lose everything in it before you're able to really understand how somebody else is feeling who has lost theirs. And so it brings you to a place where God can use you in ministry like you were not able to be used otherwise. But now there's also the postlude. What will be the outcome of the grief in my life and yours? There's going to be one of two things that's going to take place. And I close with this. Number one, we can just elect it. We can go on our merry way and never be and never be changed. We can elect it. And the reason why a lot of people elect it is because they don't want to embrace their past. No matter what kind of past you have had, if you don't embrace that past, God can't use that past until you embrace that past. Whatever is in my past, God wants to use it now for a benefit. You say, well, Brother Tommy, you don't understand some of the things I've gone through. It doesn't matter what you've gone through. God wants to use it in your life now, in the present and in the future, to be a ministry to him. And to be used for his glory. But then there's also those who embrace change. And whenever they embrace change and allow grief to change them, it's not just emotional, that is crying and weeping. But it will be changed in the will, in that on the inside of us we become even more so a different person because of the experience that we have gone through or the experiences. And so therefore, we are changed. We have learned something of what it is to surrender to Him and yield to Him. There was a lady, matter of fact, I don't know whether she's still living or still living there, but in Enterprise, Alabama, there was a lady back in the 1990s who gave a testimony at an evangelism conference that I was at. Her name, I believe, was Hilda Strickland. And this is what she said as she shared her testimony on that occasion. Whenever she stood behind that platform, folks, she wasn't the most beautiful woman I ever laid my eyes on, but there was a reason for it. This is what she said. She said, for a long time, I could, looking back, I guess you could consider me just a nominal Christian. I lived a busy life, and if I showed up at church, it may have been on Sunday morning, but I did not give God but just a limited amount of myself. I was wrapped up in living in the here and now. That's basically what she said. But she and her family were out skiing 
one day. Her husband was pulling her with a boat. She lost her balance and fell into the water. He turned around to go get her, pick her up. But as he turned around to head in her direction, the cable, the steering cable on the boat became stuck. And she was right there in the bullseye of the direction from which that boat was coming. And the prop of that boat couldn't got part of her face right here, right under the eyeball. And so you're looking at this area was gone. She had had, you know, some facial surgery and, and cosmetic surgery, things of that nature, but it was obvious that something awful had happened to her. But that's just what she said. She said, you know, God's taught me something through all of this. He has taught me what value is. It has taught me what value, what, what is really of value, what is really important. She said, God convicted me of so many things whenever I went to him with the pain that I was in and things I was enduring. And one of the things he convicted me about was my prayerlessness. Another thing he convicted me about was the fact that I had made my children my God. They had become idols to me. And I still love my children, but I've learned that they're no longer my God because only God can be God. God took a tragedy and brought it into a testimony. God wants to take your tragedies and your grief and turn it into a testimony. I pray that you and I will allow the events of our lives to be turned into testimony of the great things that God can do if we only let him. Our Father, as we come to you today, we come to you in the name of Jesus. Father, there are so many people hurting today. There are so many who are sick, many who are experiencing uh, the coronavirus. Many are very, very sickly with it. God, we pray for their healing. But Lord, at the same time that as you heal them, as you restore them, God, I pray that in the midst of their suffering, that the grief that they encountered, the pain, will not be lost. Lord, there's some who have gone to be with you. Some have just recently departed. Some have sit in the pews of this church right here a number of Sundays. They're no longer with us. Father, we pray for the families. God, may their grief not be wasted. For it's in Christ's name we pray. Amen. Amen. God bless.